today and uh, most of the things I will present come from this book I published last year. I'll read some excerpts from there, um, although uh, I'll be mostly presenting uh, in the similar way I did before the break. Um, I think that I already said something about this. So this um, sort of diagnosis of a, uh, of a sterility to which post-structuralist feminist philosophy has arrived by affirming the, um, uh, not ju just by affirming, but by insisting on certain concepts as uh, the explanatory concepts uh, of the reality of subjectivity, of human subjectivity, of gender subjectivity, of political subjectivity. So concepts that, that have uh, explanatory relevance, uh, that have, if we have to resort to philosophical terminology, that have both an epistemological and ontological status, uh, like the status of the concept of uh, mobility, transformability of the subject, uh, multiplicity, etc. Uh, so we mentioned something about that that one could identify that uh, there is so, sort of a uh, tacit prohibition in post-structuralist feminist philosophy to speak of this excluded terms uh, like the one, the stable, uh, the fixed as um, relevant for post-structuralist uh, philosophy, uh, especially that of the subject and the gendered subject or the subject caught in the uh, political uh, construction uh, or uh, triangle of discourse, uh, subject and power. So, these uh, terms are excluded as relevant for, uh, for uh, post-structuralist uh, feminist uh, philosophy, as relevant to discuss, to, to um, uh, theorize, uh, to treat them as relevant subject of philosophical investigation in the same way in which the concept of the real has been uh, assigned the same status of unthinkable or uh, theoretically irrelevant, uh, irrelevant therefore uh, simply outside the scope of interest of post uh philosophy of subjectivity and in particular that of, of feminism. Um, what I was in fact interested in was uh, the theory or the philosophy, post-structuralist philosophy of subjectivity, but uh, I made a decision to focus on the feminist theories of <coughs> subjectivity uh, because I'm a feminist, uh, so they're important to me, they're important for my research, they're important to me as an activist as well, um, but also because I think that they have been the most innovative ones. Uh, uh, the most interesting theories, the most relevant theories uh, uh, in, uh, in line with this um, tradition, it's already a tradition, of post-structuralist thought are in fact those de developed in, within feminist philosophy. So, um, uh, hence the choice to focus on Butler, um, on Irigari and Predotti mainly. Uh, also, uh, so not just because they're feminist, but also because uh, inside post-structuralist feminist uh, philosophy, I detected uh, most uh, uh, re uh, uh, realist potential potential in their work, in particular in Judith Butler's work and 
um, illegally also as well. But first, what I did is uh, something similar to what Laurel does with uh, the entire philosophy, philosophy as such, uh, philosophy with a capital P in the beginning. So I um, sort of decided to make the same, not generalization, radicalization of what post-structuralist feminist philosophy is about, uh, in particular in terms of its theories of subjectivity. And uh, going through all those relevant texts, I uh, came to this realization. I tend to be actually very empiric when I do something. Uh, and I tend to uh, create this, um, like a, how do you call it? Uh, a repository uh, of uh, concepts, ideas, uh, uh, a precise map of what appears uh, as a concept where and in what context. And it was my conclusion that indeed, everywhere, well, at least in those texts that are uh, cited in the book and that I consider, and I think it's, it would be more of a consensus among us that these are among the most the relevant, the relevant texts in feminist post-structuralist philosophy. Um, I concluded that there is, uh, th that this tacit prohibition of talking about these this several terms does exist. Um, and there is, so there is something, if you assume this uh, scientific posture of thought, so uh, the one uh, literal advo advocates, which is not mimicking the existing sciences and their uh, habitus and their uh, procedures or specific methods, if you just assume this uh, posture of thought, which would be scientific, uh, the one I believe I explained in the beginning, then you would really ask yourself, how can certain notions be simply bad for, you know, a theory, uh, bad in terms of uh, negative, uh, as in the moral sense, they imply something which is bad, we don't like it, it's not in line with our, with our political position, and also as uh, utterly irrelevant uh, to the extent of making a decision not to talk about them. Uh, if uh, in, uh, uh, the classical position of stability for the subject in the context of this uh, theoretical legacy would be that it's just something bad and it doesn't exist. Stability of a subject. Commonsensically speaking and thinking, and we all depart from commonsensical thinking when we enter philosophy or science or theory, commonsensically speaking, one wonders, uh, one sort of knows that there is some stability about the subject. So why dismissing uh, the theorizing of the subject as stable in the context of this theoretical legacy, why dismiss that in advance as irrelevant? If we haven't done it yet, in the context of this legacy, uh, where's this, uh, uh, where does this dismissal come from? It comes from philosophical reasoning because we say, Aha, uh -huh, this is something uh, the metaphysics deals with. And we are not metaphysics, so we are not dealing with it. But if you think in realist terms, if you assume, uh, if you endorse this proposal made by Larell that you correlate your, your thought with the real, then uh, uh, you, can, you, can, you can choose to do so venture to think these concepts without 
relegating uh, the entire legacy of post-structuralism as to, to, to some relevant uh, to, to, to some realm of irrelevance and declaring it like no uh, I'm not a post-structuralist anymore because I see some relevance in thinking stability so uh, the, the Laurelian way, way would be uh, I assume this norm from within I remain, remain inside post-structuralist feminist philosophy I endorse uh, the thesis that the structure, uh, that the subject is uh, uh, constructed, that that it's a construct, that this construct is a historical one, or uh, one of discourse. It's the same, uh, that it's a historical one. But I still uh, decide, while endorsing this, uh, to explore the position and the uh, relevance of stability uh, in, not inside because this would be a philosophical decision in line uh, with uh, the rest of the legacy not uh, uh, not assuming this uh, pos uh, position of relationism as Laurel would say so relationism uh, would be uh, one term is determined by the relation to the other one. Uh, so, if, uh, and that it uh, that uh, uh, sort of imposes upon you this exclusivist um, thought uh, approach that you have to choose one of the two. It's either or. Uh, the unilateral way to approach this as post-structuralist feminist philosophy is this hora. Inside this hora, I decided. Um, I agree that the subject is uh, constructed, that it's uh, uh, historically constructed, etc. Et so it, st it stays there, I endorse that, but at the same time I uh, think stability uh, on its own terms, on its own terms and as something which does not have, have to exclude the thesis that the subject is uh, constructed that it's also transformative. So it's both. It's also stable in some sense, and it's also transformative in another sense. So uh, a philosophical uh, decision is it's uh, the truth about it. For example, I realize that it is, it is true that it's uh, constructed. And then I declare it the re uh, uh, the reality of the subject. That's the real of the subject. This truth becomes the real of the subject. And this is uh, uh, what the subject, uh, it's not something about the subject with this, which is true. This is the subject. So uh, uh, this is philosophy. I I'm saying uh, the subject is tra uh, transformative, constant transformation. It's not that I'm talking about its constant transformation and these aspects of the subject and this truth about it. I'm also declaring in it to be the truth of it. The subject is constant transformation. So there is no place for thinking stability, for, for uh, thinking oneness about the subject. If uh, we assume, so dualysis is what I presented, but dualysis also implies uh, this unilateral position, this position of unilateralization of what we're talking about, uh, of what we're theorizing, what we're thinking scientifically, non philosophically, whatever you decide to call it. So, uh, instead of the, uh, uh, the theme that the problem of stability being determined by its relation to uh, uh, constructedness within a certain philosophical co uh, horizon, I'm uh, choosing to think stability in its own terms uh, as something which is determined in the last instance by the real of stability not by uh, um, uh, the, 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 the pre, uh, presuppositions of 
post-structuralist uh, philosophy. So uh, here is this move, a non-philosophical move. Uh, and what, again, uh, I would like to reaffirm that, what, again, pre uh, preserves us from uh, arbitrary improvisation is, uh, in fact, something very rigorous. Uh, it's this procedure of unilateralization uh, uh, provided by Laurel, whereby we think stability uh, in ter uh, uh, as something uh, determined in the last instance by the real of stability, not by the position of constructedness within a certain philosophical uh, uh, horizon. Um, and what I did, in fact, was to um, sort of uh, disclose uh, a certain prohibition, as I said, to speak of certain uh, terms, like uh, the one, the, the stable, uh, a certain prohibition inside this legacy, uh, which nonetheless uh, uh, does not prove, quite to the contrary, displays symptomatically the re relevance of these notions that have been excluded. And the fact that these notions are a certain real can assume <coughs> the position of a real. We can correlate with and should correlate with if we assume this non-philosophical uh, approach uh, is that these uh, concepts like uh, the stable or the one, for example, uh, behave inside post-structuralist feminist philosophy as the symptom in, uh, in Lacan, as the symptom or as Tiché uh, in Aristotelian terms, uh, and so here, yeah, I had to use this analogy from Lacan. Uh, these concepts are not provided by Laurel himself, uh, but they uh, sort of work well together, or they build on one another. Laurel's uh, idea of the real as something which is outside language, outside what makes sense, outside philosophy, outside thought, and in that sense it would be meaningless. So this is maximum, he has been spe specific about how it um, appears vis-a-vis uh, -vis language. Uh, and from that point on, I had to take recourse uh, a little bit uh, to Lacan and to Aristotle and to these notions of uh, trauma, symptom, and tiché uh, uh, in order to display the, 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 the symptomatic presence of the real or the status of being a symptom of the real of these notions that are um, uh, sort of precluded from uh, post-structuralist uh, theory of subjectivity, in particular uh, uh, the feminist one. Uh, all right, we'll, we'll go to, uh, we'll read this one later on. I, uh, I decided to read a bit from the cut of the real in order to <coughs> illustrate how it has worked for me, how it, it's play, played out in this um, attempt, this project of mine, uh, how this uh, uh, sort of map of symptoms of the real as, uh, is established in the work of uh, Judith Butler, and then later on I propose a way uh, of and not including it in the, in the discourse, but uh, being able to speak of the two 
uh, of stability uh, and also of transformability without abandoning and uh, what is relevant, what is evidently useful inside uh, of post-structuralist feminist theory. So this is a sort of a non-insight of a post-structuralist feminist uh, philosophy, like the non in non-Marxism, this would be uh, the non in feminist philosophy of subjectivity since the 90s, the one which has been dominant since the 90s on. Um, so in this bit I'm going to read, um, I'm analyzing uh, Psychic Life of Power, Undoing Gender, it's not a book that has been much discussed but it, it's been, uh, it was relevant for me and for, for my study, that's the, the book where before precarious life, where uh, the concept of the real and the de uh, derealization appears in Butler and it appears as, as something relevant to discuss philosophically and something also of political relevance. She speaks of uh, the procedure of derealization, of rendering certain cat uh, categories of people unreal as a procedure, a political procedure par excellence of suppression, of political suppression. Mm. All right, so the psychic life of power uh, by Judith Butler, I found one rare explicit, uh, uh, one of the rare explicit references in post structuralist feminist philosophy to a possible site of continuity for the subject. Now, it's, uh, this is interesting. She keeps looking for the site of continuity at the places in her work where she also looks for the possibility of resistance. So, as if the, um, uh, this search for the site of continuity uh, equates is, is, is complete uh, is uh, as if it were equal to the search for the site the, the site of resistance the possibility for resistance for the subject which is caught up in this network of you know discourse power relation and relation sense and is produced by them so. Uh, there I found one of the rare explicit references in, uh, to a possible site of continuity for the subject. And in a later work uh, by Butler, Undoing Gender, which was published in 2004, I found a reiterated unequivocal claim about the tasks of persistence and survival for the I. So, there is a look for a site of continuity, uh, a search for a site of continuity, and also a uh, search for a site, or, uh, and also a discussion, process this discussion, which is com uh, always relevant, uh, uh, related to resistance, uh, of the, uh, about the tasks of persistence and survival. So, persistence and survival <coughs> have been as if linked with continuity for the subject. And this is not, I guess, by chance, because in uh, Foucault, if you remember, the, the dissociated uh, self, the disintegrated self, uh, body, and the dissociated self is uh, the self which is um, utterly in control of the dominant discourse of the institution. So uh, the subjection in Foucault takes place through this dissociation of the self. So it's sort of logical that she looks for a site con for, of continuity in order, uh, uh, linking it to tasks of persistence in order to locate the site of uh, resistance. So continuity, persistence, survival. For the I, she says I, they are not uh, the self or the subject. In Psychic Life of Power, 
So following Foucault's line of theorizing, the notions of subject, power, and discourse, and more specifically his conceptualizations of the body and the soul, and their respective roles in the subject formation, Butler refers to the body as the site of subject's transform uh, transformativity. So, we have this uh, opposition, this dichotomy be be between the body and the soul. So, the soul is, as we know, the disciplinary product of, um, in Foucaultian sense, the disciplinary product of uh, power, that's the subject, so it would be the subject. Uh, and it's constantly produced by power, so she, she locates the, the processes of this production of the soul or the subject on the territory, let's say, of the body. She refers to the body as the site of subject's transformativity. When considered as a possible site of transformation, the body is referred to in its materiality or physicality. That is in its aspect of the real. Why am I equating this with the real? If you remember in a bodies that matter, the body is, the body is uh, treated also as a site of uh, signification <coughs> of uh, production of uh, the imaginary. The, the body is also considered as the site of the imaginary. But here in uh, the psychic life of power, where she wants to make a distinction betwe between these processes of signification and subject production and something which is outside of that, the body becomes something else. It, it, it becomes something material. Uh, she she uh, does not make uh, any relevance to the possibility, uh, a reference to the possibility of its imaginarization. It is treated as if something completely opposite to language, to subject production, to the, the work of the imaginary. It is something else. This something utterly different and else is if you go through the text, uh, it, it's evident under explicit uh, uh, references where, uh, where it is uh, stated uh, to be uh, as something linked to the material, some, to the physicality, as something, as I said, opposed to the, projects of, uh, the processes of signification. So this is a different real. Uh, this is a different body, actually, in psychic level of power. Then, uh, and this is a later work from '97. Then the body in bodies that matter, which is uh, an utter product of imaginarization. It's an imaginary side. So, um, so when considered as a possible side of transformation, the body is referred to in its materiality. Uh, and uh, there are quotes here from the book where this explicitly, uh, which refer to the fact that it's explicitly referred to as such as materiality or physicality. Uh, and uh, they, ob uh, they ob uh, and obviously in their aspects of the real, that which is beyond language. In that sense, this site of transformations, the body, is inescapably the same and one. So the transformations that take place, they're discursive, right? Uh, the subject is this uh, the, uh, product of constant processes of transformation, they're discursive, but the site where they take place and which is outside of these processes is the body. So it is implied that this stack site is stable. So we need this stability in order to explain the following. And the following, you will see, is actually the site of resistance. So in that sense, the site of transformations is inescapably the same and one, the body. Thus, what is clearly said is that the subject is never really identical to itself and is always already a process the processes of transformation. 
And what is Im implicated is that the site of transformability subsists as the same and one. Surely, the imagined body, the one she writes about in Bodies That Matter, is a territory of signification which undergoes change. Nonetheless, inasmuch as it is the site the butler, uh, that Butler uh, refers to, it is the body proper conceived in its opposition to the soul. Uh, both terms are provided from Foucault. So, she follows uh, uh, Foucault's uh, dichotomy here. Body, soul. Soul would be, you know, territory of the subject. So, uh, here she is following this logic of this Foucauldian dichotomy between the body and the soul. Therefore, the body in this context is, is physicality and it is the real because it is detached from the workings of the imaginary and the language. How do I infer this? Uh, because according to her, the real is the Lacanian real, the one which is unthinkable, one which is beyond language. Uh, this is why the, the body is as if not real in bodies that matter because it's you know, just uh, populated with, uh, uh, with the imaginary. Uh, so as if it were not, you know, body proper or not, uh, no, uh, as if it did not have the aspect of the real, because she's clear about that. The real is something which is outside language and something which we do not, uh, we find it irrelevant to even talk about. Um, when she was here in Nogrit, the seminar we did together, uh, uh, we had this debate about the real, and she said, the real, there is nothing to say there about the real. You can either cry or laugh, and that's it. The real, the, there is no language about the real. So, but let's not rely on that statement, oral statement by her. Uh, the, Things are already there in the texts and themselves. So uh, we're discussing psychic life of power. So there she says, uh, um, the, uh, the body is therefore the site of transformability. The transformability is something which is which belongs to the realm of signification, language, etc. So surely the imagined body is, as a territory of signification undergoes change. Nonetheless, uh, in as much as it is the site that uh, Butler refers to, it is the body proper, conceived in its opposition to the soul, in line with uh, Foucault's terminology. Therefore, the body in this context is physicality and it is the real, detached from the working of the imaginary and the language. It is a passive sight. In psychic life of power, precisely thanks to this dichotomy, it is evident that the body is here. It is treated as a passive sight. There is a point when it becomes again the, the, the realm of the imaginary, but then she again speaks about the subject. Uh, 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 at the point where, when she tries to, uh, where, where she operates with, with a clear opposition between body and soul, or the subject and body, uh, and these are indicatively the places where she looks for the site of resistance, then the body is something which is in total opposition. To, uh, it appears as such, as such in the text, in total opposition with, absolute opposition with, uh, with, uh, uh, with respect to language. So it is a passive sight. After stating clearly that, and I am quoting her here, after stating clearly that for Foucault, this process of subjectivation takes place centrally through the body, 
Butler engages in a critical reading of Foucault's main idea, which aims at amending his theoretical position by way of introducing a psychoanalytic perspective to it. Or the other way around. Uh, what, uh, or the other way around. Uh, uh, that criticism, uh, that criticism, she says this, this is a quotation, a uh, uh, quote, uh, that criticism will entail a re-emergence of a Foucauldian perspective within psychoanalysis. So we enter psychoanalysis, uh, we operate with the real, Lacan's real, and we introduce Foucault there. And uh, about this methodological procedures, she, she's, she's clear, she states this uh, explicitly. This was a quote. So, the main goal of such a theoretical move is the introduction of a greater emphasis on the subject's inherent dimension of ambiguity. And what is meant by that is that the subject, or the identity, as the imprisoning effect of the soul, according to Foucault, insofar as it is totalizing, is apart from being constraining, also an instance that has formative of, or generative effects. So the soul is imprisoning, but it also has formative and generative uh, effects. That's this, uh, uh, this is uh, this classical situation of uh, uh, facing the ambiguity of uh, Butlerian and Foucaultian subject is both something which uh, can be um, uh, an agency of resistance transformation, but also something which is a total product of uh, the disciplinary processes. So, um, so it's interesting this uh, um, totalizing uh, discipline, uh, disciplining effects of the soul which are imprinted upon the body are also formative and uh, generative. So what is restrictive, what is disciplinary uh, is also something, uh, it, it is also something which, which creates uh, the subject as also an active agency. So this is the ambiguity, the two facetness of uh, uh, the Foucaultian and Butlerian subject. So, these formative, generative effects are the results of precisely the prohibition and restriction, this is a quote again, uh, imposed by the constraints of the soul, producing the frame of imprisonment. Uh, by this, it, uh, we mean, uh, or they mean, Butler and Foucault, uh, the disciplinary effects of uh, the dominant discourse. Uh, imprisonment is but the form of subjectivity generated through those processes of restriction and discipline. The subject is the only possible active instance. It is an agency, and yet again, it is that passive imprint of constraint and imprisonment. Hence, the claim about the subject's constitutive ambiguity. This theoretical move of Butler is enabled by her critical rethinking of the clear-cut dichotomy between body and soul and Foucault, which she aims to undermine, bypass or sur surpass um, and she says the following in this context. Uh, the transposition of the soul into an exterior and imprisoning frame for the body vacates, as it were, the interiority of the body, leaving that interiority as a malleable surface for the unilateral effects of uh, disciplinary power. So, if we see the body in this way, it's passive, obviously, uh, and it also some, uh, uh, it also preserves some space which is vacated from, which is uh, free 
from the disciplinary effects of uh, the imprisoning soul or the imprints of uh, the uh, of power and discourse or discourse in power. So this is already an indication uh, that we should perhaps look in the body uh, for the source of resistance. So she's moving slowly toward that uh, thesis. And in the end, she, she abandons it. Never mind, what is important is that she uh, keeps orbiting around this question and around the possibility that the body is the most possible location of uh, resistance. So, this quotation speaks of the body-soul, interiority, exteriority, opposition, uh, and that it is inherently related to her critical observation that Foucault, in particular in Discipline and Punish, <coughs> reduces soul to the subject taken as a position within the symbolic order to use a Lacanian parlance. Uh, with this in mind, Butler says that Foucault's discourse on subjectivity, if not supplemented by psychoanalytic theory, leave, uh, leaves a uh, little space, if any, for the location of resistance of the subject. Where does the resistance to or in uh, disciplinary subject formation take, pl uh, take place? Uh, I mean, she's right to identify this problem. Uh, that uh, if uh, uh, Foucault is right that the, the subject is uh, a, project, a product of uh, discourse power uh, structures in place of, of the ruling discourse, if it is simply a product of it, it would be really this imprisonment uh, and there would be hardly any place there for, for resistance. And it is for this reason that she attempts to locate the possibility, uh, the, the possibility that the body might be that uh, site of resistance. So, uh, if Foucault is right, then uh, uh, where does uh, the resistance to or indisciplinary subject formation take place? Does the reduction of the psychoanalytically rich notion of a psyche to that of the imprisoning soul eliminate the possibility of resistance to normalization and to subject formation, a resistance that emerges precisely from the incommensurability between psyche and subject? Butler rejects recourse to the romanticized notion of the unconscious as a possible answer proposed by psychoanalysis to the question of the location of resistance for the subject. What makes us think that the unconscious is any less structured uh, by the uh, power relations uh, that pervade, uh, uh, pervade cultural signifiers than is the language of the subject, she asks. So she attempts to transport the ambiguity that marks the Foucauldian subject, its two-faceted passive-active character, issuing from the subject's complicity with the power in the disciplinary formation, into the unconscious. The result of such gesture is, however, not fruitful. Namely, it becomes even, even more difficult to establish the location and trace the, the mechanisms of resistance within the psyche. It is at this point a virtual dead end in the discussion that Butler reintroduces the question of the body. So she says, before continuing this interrogation of uh, psychoanalysis, however, let us return to the problem of the bodies in Foucault. By searching for that which is outside the Foucauldian soul, outside the subject articulated by the mechanisms of power, that mere position within the Lacanian symbolic, as, uh, as the possible locus of resistance for the eye, Butler is attempting to locate that thing which glues the bundle called subject together. Uh, how do I, uh, now, uh, what do I mean? This is again a quote. This is a quote from Braidotti. 
It's also uh, interesting, uh, interesting in Brain Doty, in Metamorphosis. Um, she speaks of uh, uh, transformativity of the multiplicity of the subject, etc., etc. And she keeps returning to the problem that there should be something which is stable and continuous and links everything together. But it's indicative that she does not decide to come up with a theoretical or rigorous uh, explication of what that is uh, or conceptualization of that, what that is, but she decides to use a metaphor uh, which uh, a metaphor which is uh, which sort of explains what, what she's talking about without using a theoretical term uh, and also tries to dismiss its relevance at the same time. So she speaks of this glue, uh, of this something which glues the bundle, this is a quote from Bredotti, called subject together. So what is this thing which glues that bundle called subject? Why do we decide not to speak about it theoretically? Uh, how can a theoretical account of, of this glue undermine the th thesis about uh, the subject's constructedness and transformability? It does not have to. It seems that it has to only if your, uh, your thought, as Laurel said, succumbs to the dictate of philosophy rather than the real. If you think unilaterally, you can account for that without undermining the thesis of, uh, about the constructiveness. And this is uh, what I'm trying to do here. And uh, maybe I should just read this passage so that we all see if I have succeeded or not. So um, uh, how do I come to this uh, conclusion? To answer this question, let us consider the following hypothesis. If, while one is searching for that, uh, is there enough time to, okay, uh, to hurry up? Uh, uh, if, while one is searching for that topos of critique regarding one's own subject position, one finds oneself drawn into and taken by that transformative instance, which is a process, one remains inside the confines of a, a construct that is substitutable, uh, the subject, uh, for identity and subject constructions. So th that's something which can be substituted. The locus of resistance is, however, a potentiality of situating oneself within a stance of critical detachment from the continuous auto-generated process of subjection. So I'm proposing this thesis uh, uh, in her own terms. If the disciplinary hold of the, of the discourse takes place, place to uh, subject formations, and if the subject is, is transformative, if, and if what the, uh, this, uh, the power does to us is producing us as this tra transformative subject, then the resistance should be outside the processes of constant transformation, which is the realm, uh, 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 the domain, uh, or the dominion, even, of power. So uh, the, the resistance has to be uh, somewhere outside of this process. Uh, so this is how the non is employed. Uh, the, the proposition in, is made in terms of post-structuralist uh, philosophy. So the locus of uh, resistance is, however, a potentiality of situating oneself with a stance of a critical detachment from the continuous auto-generated processes of subjection, of being a subject. Thus, it is a situating beyond the instance of tra transformability, which by definition belongs to the d domain of the subject, right? So we're talking in terms of uh, uh, post-structuralist theory. 
transformability is the domain of the subject. The subject is the product of power. Hence, resistance has to be outside of that. On their own terms. Uh, in terms of uh, post-structuralism. So it is an instance that continues to be there as a possibility of critical distance. So let's call it a critical distance, not, not some absolute uh, uh, exteriority vis-a-vis -vis the processes of subjection, uh, but a certain outside which enables critical distance. So it is a possibility of critical distance with regard to the ceaseless processuality. In other words, this is a location of an always already possible critical positioning. We need a situation in the context of post-structuralist feminist forces, in context of Butler, we need a name, a term, a concept that we can imagine uh, for this always already possible critical positioning. It is the topos of emergence of any resistance to the oppressions effectuated through any subjectivity and thus not taken by the power structures pertaining to that subject. This topos can only be that thing that Bro uh, Braidotti calls the glue for the non-unitary subject. So let's agree it's a non-unitary subject, but we we're looking for the glue now. Uh, it is an instance of continuity and persistence of the critical stance beneath, behind, or beyond, or merely parallel to and detached from the processes of subjection and identification. <coughs> so, it is a continuous uh, uh, instance, uh, an, an instance of continuity and persistence vis-a-vis -vis the proce processes of subject transformation. So, it's already implied that this continuity is necessary. And there is very uh, little, uh, uh, the distance is really short and there is very little which uh, would uh, distinguish, uh, no, no, there is, the, they, they are distinct, but uh, uh, continue, uh, the point is continuity and stability are linked, so sort of one, it implicates or implies the other. Um, so I'm trying here to, to arrive to stability through continuity, persistence, survival, to arrive to stability. So the implicated link between resistance and continuity of the I, that I see in psychic life of power, is confirmed uh, or even affirmed by Butler in Undoing Gender when she says the possibility of my persistence, this is a quote, the possibility of my persistence as an I depends upon my being able to do something with what is done to me. Uh, well, what is done to me is the subject production by the structures of power, by, by the ruling discourse. This is the subject product. This is how, according to her and Foucault, the, the subject is produced. Well, uh, my, uh, as a, re a resisting subject, as a subject of resistance, uh, I need this possibility, I'm, uh, I'm quoting her, the possibility of my persistence as an I, depending uh, upon my being able to do something with what is done to me. Uh, Undergoing, uh, under, uh, Undoing Gender is a book that insists on the task of survival of the self. It's about the survival of the set, uh, self, um, uh, this book. Um, she continues a little bit along the same lines in Precarious Life too. So she uh, uh, still, it, undoes neither the concept of subjectivity, I must say, as conceived in Psychic Life of Power, nor the argument concerning the topology 
uh, of the resistance and continuity as proposed in the same book. So, let's see. Uh, can the body be the site of revolt in the context of post-structuralist uh, theory? And uh, in line with Michel Foucault's proposition and Butler's as well. She keeps, uh, okay, I'll uh, say that in the end I conclude that uh, she does not, even she herself is almost uh, explicit about it, that the body is not quite the, the site of resistance, but there is something there as a possibility. But I find it symptomatic that it, she keeps looking there. Uh, so, exploring the possibility of identifying the locus of resistance in Foucault, whereby the soul or the subject have been dismissed as clearly named and claimed as the instrument of power, uh, Butler inevitably invests the core of her investigation in the direction of the issue of the body as that possible location of resistance. In this particular work of, of Foucault, just quote that there, uh, uh, Discipline and Punish, according to Butler's meticulous reading, uh, the subject is nowhere to be read in the vein of its, the subjects, which is its also powers, notorious ambivalence. So the, we don't find there the ambivalent subject, which is also an agency of change, of self-invention, self-transformation, uh, but also at the same product of power, etc., a sheer product of, of power. Uh, this uh, this uh, sort of metaphor of the prison. In this book, in Discipline and, and uh, Punish, according to her, we don't find the ambiguity. We just uh, meet this uh, subject that is sheer product of power. Uh, the, the subject which is almost as if impossible to conceive as one of resistance. This means that any possibility for the subject to also be interpreted as the bearer, location or agency of resistance is already in advance uh, dismissed. It is for this reason that she invites us to return to the problem of the bodies in Foucault. This invitation is immediately followed by a question. Uh, I'm quoting. Uh, how and why is resistance denied to bodies produced through disciplinary regimes? Uh, she means in Foucault. How and why is resistance denied to bodies in the disciplinary regimes? This is an introduction to the subsequent brief investigation of the possibility of the body as conceptualized in Foucauldian discourse, being that sui generis topos of resistance. Uh, we read it, again a quote from Psychic Life of Power. Uh, it appears there is an insight to the body which exists before power's invasion. So we are imagining now, we are constructing this temporal uh, solution, a certain before, temporal before. It appears that there is an insight to the body which exists before power's invasion. But given the radical exteriority of the soul, how are we to understand interiority in Foucault? That interiority will not be the soul. Uh, it will not be a psyche. But what will it be, she asks. Is this a space of pure malleability, one which is, as it were, ready to conform to the, the, to the demands of socialization? Or is this interiority to be called simply the body? Has it come to the paradoxical point where Foucault wants to claim that the soul is the exterior form and the body interior space? And if this hypothesis is right, then she 
uh, this is her proposition. If this hypothesis works, then let's see if uh, uh, resistance can be located in the body. So this is another signal that we're looking for resistance as something which would be on, a, the, on the territory of almost the real, of that which is outside uh, language. And it's already clear that it's also an instance of continuity, uh, an instance of stability, but it's never explicitly said so. Uh, this uh, explicit reference to, uh, to such concepts uh, resembles uh, Bredotti's choice to speak of the global. If uh, the answers to these questions were to be affirmative, we would be facing a rather conservative position by Foucault, and it would indeed be so, not only because such a statement would bear the anachronistic overtones of the traditional metaphysical contempt for the body, but also because it would leave no space for a, potentially, uh, a potentiality of resistance and critique. Following Butler, I would also dismiss already in advance such a hypothetical reading since it is in utter disagreement with the most fundamental presuppositions and concerns of uh, Foucauldian discourse. So the body does not have that uh, position and the soul is not such uh, absolute exteriority. So I'll just skip these bits. So. I agree with Butler to some point and I develop it a little bit further so we cannot speak about such classical opposition between the body and the soul in, in Foucault. So that would imply that the body cannot be uh, clean of, from uh, the processes of power subjection. Uh, and this is why she dismisses uh, in the end the body as the location of resistance. So it means that she has been searching for something which is outside the language as resistance, as something which is close to the real. I think it's, it's lunch time. We can continue after the break or I can conclude with the following paragraph and we can continue after the break. Although I wanted to talk about Marx after the break. Uh, let me jump to the conclusion and wrap up uh, now. Mm. Uh, the conclusion is, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not sure if, if it says more than what I've presented so far, uh, that it's uh, simply symptomatic. Um, the quest for continuity, stability, uh, and proximity to the real as that instance which is uh, prelingual as the site of uh, resistance. Uh, so which points out to the uh, need for, for these terms in psycho, uh, psycho uh, post-structuralist uh, theory as well. So here uh, the concluding passages and we'll move to lunch and in the afternoon we can uh, have a little talk around this and I'll continue with Marx because we agreed that tomorrow we reserve the day for the presentations, right? So, so it will have to be that way. So in effect, uh, Butler and Foucault's theory fails to provide a clear response to this question. Subjectivity remains to be explicitly formulated as a disciplinary instance and is only implicitly understood as the agency, agency of resistance. It is proclaimed by both Foucault and Butler as such, the agency of resistance and critique, on the basis of the implications provided by the presence of power in, as its constituent. Therefore, one concludes the location of revolt uh, has to be looked for elsewhere and outside of what is strictly known as the subject. 
Furthermore, this location has to be the site of resistance for and within a certain self or an I. And she chooses I and self instead of subject when she, she, she looks for this site of resistance. Since the revolt um, or resistance is that which enables the subject's self-critique and self-transformation, one is obliged to assume that there is a certain continuity of an I behind these transformations. After all, if a subject can die for a new one to be born, one has to imagine I'm talking about the transformations. One has to imagine a territory or a period, it has to be, it can be time, it can be space, the stopos, of absence or lack, a fissure in the endless positive processes of change. So a certain lack of anything, which would be the same as the real, is what enables continuity and transformation, paradoxically. Uh, but it coincides with the concept of the real, as we work uh, with here. So, uh, a territory or a period of absence or lack of fissure in the endless positive process of change. Certainly, if one assumes that the dissolution of the subject is lived, experienced, appropriated as one's own subject dissolution, right? I'm, the, the, I'm talking about the death of the subject in order for the new to emerge. If I undergo this dissolution, this death, and I'm witnessing it, I'm, uh, uh, this witness belongs to the territory of, territory of Bray Dottis clue. So if the, the, the extinguishing, the disappearance of the subject is an experience of, of a self-dissolution, there is an instance that undergo this experience that claims it as its own. It, it is I who is dying as the I I once knew. It is the instance of continuity behind the changes which claims possession of these changes. Uh, moreover, in the context of Butler's and Foucauldian uh, theory, this instance of continuity is to, to be presumed to be the location of resistance. So it's not just survival, it's not just about survival. survival. Uh, precisely in Foucault and Butler it is uh, implied, it, uh, it is presumed even, that this would be also the location of resistance because a uh, subject is the product of the disciplinary hold of discourse power. Um, uh, this is, uh, this instance of cont continuity is to be presumed to be the location of resistance because it is from the standpoint of only that instance that one can introduce, undergo and endure subjectivity transformations, but also critically distance from them or resist to them.